talk with our hands. So, I'm sorry. So, thank you. So, thank you, Pastor. It, this is a special day for me. Uh, first of all, because I get to come here and see you, give you part of my talk. I can talk louder. Is this not on? Okay. All right. Let's move it up. All right. We will turn you up. Pastor, you are ready to record. We're ready. Thank you. Okay, and I will try to speak loud. Anyway, this is a special day for me. I get to come here and share my testimony and, and talk about my book. Um, Mrs. Dreyer, I'm glad you're here. Um, and... I, I was, I'm glad I should see you because I had, a, I had a flashback about my early teaching days when we were young teachers. We had what was called Observation Day, and the, the department head or the principal would come into our class unannounced just to see how, how we were doing with our lessons. And I was always afraid to bomb. I didn't want to bomb on that day. So Mrs. Dreyer was my teacher for math and French, and she, she was an excellent teacher. She is, she is one of the best, and one of my favorites, and one of my wife Sherry's favorites too. So not only do you have a red flower for the ladies, but I, I brought one for Mrs. Dreyer oh, to make sure that she gets that. So thank you, thank you for for teaching. teaching. So she was kind of like the principal, and if she's the principal, Pastor Kenyon was the superintendent. So I hope I don't bomb today either, Pastor. Um, he he was my first pastor, and as far as I'm concerned, always my pastor. Um, you were there for the birth of all three of my daughters. Um, you did uh, presided over the funeral of my sister Karen when she passed. You've been in my life for over 50 years. And uh, more recently, as my family needed you, you were always there for us. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. But you hold my Oh, I think I can do that. Okay, is that better, there? Yeah. Sorry for you, Zoomers. Uh, I know Dan and Bill are on the room. Um, we've been friends for over 50 years, and I've been blessed to have them in my room. So I said so this is the day for me, it is. I'm not even at the special day for me. But 51 years ago, I was standing in the same spot and I gave my first talk to the CAs. Wow. <laughs> Pastor, do you remember what I said about that day? It's okay. But anyway, I, I was nervous then and I, I got to speak to the CAs. We had the folding doors here in the sanctuary then. And I gave a talk, and I still remember what that was about, about knowing God. Like we, can, we can know God is there. We can know about God. Or, but, or do we really know God? Hmm. Yeah. And then after I was finished, Pastor came out behind the folding doors. He was sneaky. He snuck in there in the back there. And I'm glad because if I knew he was there, I would have really been nervous. So... <laughs> I appreciate you very much. And I know you didn't get a red flower. I don't know. I couldn't find a manly flower, but I just wanted to acknowledge you for everything. You Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. So I started attending here when I was 16. Um, yeah. Your son Howard and Bill Wilson. Mike yeah, sure. I wasn't saved then, but shortly thereafter, there was a like crusades in town, the Ford Bill Fox Crusade. Everybody yes. remembers that. And I started to go there. Um, and that's where the Lord started to convict my heart. Um, 
I had been around church a lot of my life. I was raised Catholic, but I never had a relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. there was a family here in church that, that took me to the crusade almost every night. I didn't have my driver's license then. And um, they, they took me in and treated me like a son. I took me there every Every night, I think we went every night. Yeah. Now, if you can envision the Billy Graham crusade where hundreds of people are going forward, I came across a statistic um, in some of my research. Would you say, of all those hundreds of people, how many people continued their walk with the Lord after they went forward? Would you say 75%, 50%? 33%. What would your guess be? Uh, 75. 75. Actually, it's 33%. Mm -hmm. One third of people that went forward did not continue their walk with the Lord. So the question is, why, why is that? Now, in Matthew 13, verses 3 to 9, this tells a parable. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, The farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came out, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell along the forest which grew up and choked the plants. Still yeah. other seed fell on good soil, mm. where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears has been here. So my seed fell on good soil, and the family that took me in, yeah. they were in my early years when yeah. I walked with the Lord. Yeah. And and that sweet lady is still serving the Lord to this day. I always consider her my spiritual mom. Mm -hmm. She's also my adopted mom. Yeah. And the book that, that I'm going to talk about, and you can see it in the background, this book is dedicated to her. You want to know who, she, who it is? <laughs> oh, it's just me, you know. I love you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, son. <clears throat> so my story called in the book called Stony Ground or Good Soil goes into detail of the events leading up to my spiritual birthday, which was May 12th. <laughs> okay. You've all heard the term selfie. Anybody have their phone real handy real quick? What? You take a selfie with the author. But I have to walk all around and do that. Let me do that real quick. Sorry, Pastor. I do move around. So this is the term selfie. I'm leading up to something. <laughs> it okay, so you all know the word selfie. Now there's another word. I may have coined this phrase because I never never heard anybody else use it, but have you ever heard the term smell pee? No? Let me give you a hint. Okay. Uh -oh. Smell pee. Uh -oh. now, why is he going to say that? In addition to being the good soil that we're supposed to be, we're told in Philippians 4, we're supposed to be the sweet, smelling aroma and well pleasing to God. Grace and her husband Harry smell just like that. I, had a, I came across the devotion a few years ago and I had to give it to mom. They yeah. smelled like Christ. And we are not only to be good, good soil, but we have to smell like Christ as well. Mm -hmm. So the last four years, my wife Harry and I attended Fair Contrition Center. Um, we were involved in rangers and missionettes and teaching children's church, Sunday school, other ministries. Yes. Um, we have three grown and married daughters. 
three godly sons of all and seven grandchildren. Pastor mentioned one, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Jamie, who she did. She works for CBS in Baltimore. And she she won two Emmys, one for writing and one for production. And I was, I was a proud dad. Just have a picture with her and he's here. So Jeannie always wanted to be a star growing up. And she is a star. That's her last name, Jeannie Star. Yeah. So if you ever want to look her up on YouTube or whatever, you can see she's That's working right. on another project as we speak. So <clears throat> History asked me to talk about my book, Issues of the Heart. Uh, it was a long time coming, uh, maybe 10 years since I wrote the first story. Um, the cover is a picture of the sunset at Ford Skew. So if you get a chance to go see the sunsets in Ford Skew, they're spectacular sometimes. And the back picture is Surrey Point Bridge. Yeah, I'm not far from there, but it's a place I go many times. A year. As I was writing, my wife shared, and she was my first time of editing. I would write a story and I'd say, Here, share, fix the grammar. And then, she, as a true teacher, she had her red pens and she's marking it all up. And by the time I got back, it was red all over the place. <laughs> so she was a, a big help that way. But more importantly, she and I. I would pray over the book because <clears throat> number one, I, I wrote the book to be a legacy for my children and grandchildren. Um, but I wanted it to be a ministry. And we prayed that the words would minister, people would be blessed and encouraged, and <clears throat> hopefully people would it would work, the book would fall in hands of people that maybe did not know the Lord. And maybe they would come to know the Lord because of it. I plan on making a testimony yeah. book. And I hope I can fill it up with testimonies like that. And I already have my first century, um, at least indirectly, and maybe directly, someone that I did not know they were about to pass away came across the book. And not just from my help, but from the others involved but dealing with the book this person gave his heart to the lord before he passed mm -hmm. and that's going to be a neat story we can share at some point so I, over the last year and a half i i've had some life challenges and if it wasn't for the help of my friend and sister from a different set of parents the book would never have been completed mm -hmm. Now, sister, Thank you. Thank you. I, I am not a tech person. She kind of took over and helped get everything to the publisher. Everything needed it. So, thank you. All right. Two of the stories in my book. There's, it's a collection of 28 stories, uh, and they're all over pretty much. Two of them speak of my sister, Karen, who passed away. At the age of 44, I her down with cancer. And that was in 2001. One of my stories, the title was, I thought I was being asked a favor. Now, I remember visiting my sister Karen maybe two, two or three weeks before she passed. And if any of you have had that experience with a loved one going through cancer, and seeing them in the last couple of weeks of life, you know, it's, it's their struggling. And uh, I was over there one day, and she looked up at me and she said, Brother, can I do anything for you? Hard to fucking move. And she's asking me, me. I'm like, no, sis, I'm fine. She says, How about, can I ask you a favor? And I'm like, yeah. She said, will you do my funeral? I, like that was the hardest question I have ever been asked in my life. And I said, I can't do this. But I, I said, okay, okay. But Pastor ended up presiding over the funeral, but I gave the eulogy. And that was one of the most difficult things I ever had to do in life. But 
Yeah. I look back on it and I think, thank you for that opportunity. See, when we're asked to do a favor yes. for someone in the ministry, whether it's baking or visiting, or they, you know, those people are blessed, but we are the ones that are blessed. And, and Paul said the Philippians 417, you know, when they're talking about giving the, the uh, collection or the offerings to Paul, he said, I don't want that for myself. I want it so through down to your account. So next time you're asked to, to, to do a favor, realize, you know, you're the one that's going to be blessed as well. All right. <laughs> So here's here's a question you might be asked. I guess so. How many wrestlers are out there in our audience? Nine. Nobody. <laughs> no one. It, hmm? Okay. Well, think about this for a second. Um, I wrestled in high school and college, and I gained life experiences and life lessons from that sport. It's not an easy sport. So. <clears throat> Ephesians 6 12 says from the New King James Version, where we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual ghosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So, did you ever have a battle in life? Have you ever felt attacked by the enemy? Have you ever judged because of your faith? Or feel like giving up on your faith? Have you ever been accused unjustly without being confessed? If you could answer yes to any of those above, you might be a wrestler after <laughs> Two life lessons from the sport. There were men, the two of them with a number. Um, one of them is the term wrestling. Captain Willie Crabb was a wrestler, so he knows too. Get up off the mat, do whatever you can do, get up off the mat. Now, most of the guys we wrestled with, they were respectful. We knew the moves doing this, and, and just they wanted, they wanted to do me. But, you know, we were respectful of each other. But every once in a while, there would be a hothead that thought he knew everything, and he was going to just show you how good he is. So, of course, I did do some Christian love cancer, but we would, we would secure their arms that they couldn't, couldn't use their arms, and then their face, we would push them all over the mat. So did that because we get mat burns on your nose, your forehead, on your cheeks. Don't be a wise guy, or we're going to get a mat burn. And then when, when they had them walk around school the next day, they all had mat burns. <laughs> and people knew you got your face rubbed in the mat. <laughs> the lesson in life there are things that try to get us down and put us on the back you gotta get up another term um, that we talked about coach said don't you ever go in the tank now, what's that thing, coach um, if you remember any of you remember Warren Elliott from high school he was my, my coach and uh I love him as a coach too. And um, don't go in the tank. Means don't, don't ever give up. If you get if the wrestle went in the tank, I'm done. Uh, here. So don't do that. That was a bit like this. All right. As Christians, we want to do things for the Lord, right? Yeah. Did you ever say to the Lord, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do? <laughs> And then he tells us to do something. And he said, Really? That? You want me to do that? Did somebody else do it? I really didn't have that in mind, Lord. So sometimes he asks us to do things that make us get out of our comfort zone. And uh, I've been on five mission trips over the years, and two of the stories in the book relate to that. <laughs> Out of my comfort zone, and I felt the Lord tell me to do something I really didn't. I was in the Dominican Republic, 
kind of remember, John, Lord, okay. Lord, whatever you need, I will do it. Yeah. It's a construction trip. Um, there, Dan Cologne was with me, and we ended up in all buildings all week. <clears throat> but there was one day where we had to go minister to a local school. <laughs> so we were gathering in the morning, and the team, almost everybody was younger than, than us. Um, they said, do we need, we need three clowns because we're going to minister to the, to the kids in the school. And right away, two, two of the younger people, they stood up, they volunteered. And I'm just thinking to myself, I just let it go over my head. It's not my call. And then they called again because they only had two. And uh, my friend, I don't want to mention Steve's name in case he's listening. But he said, he's Sam getting ready to go it. back to Ecuador again. Yeah. He just said, Sam will do it. Look at him. And I said, I think, I said, shut up. I'm not going to do that. I hope I didn't say that, but I think it did. Going to Ecuador with him? I'm not, I'm scared, I'm not scared of it yet. Not a little bit But so I got up and I went down the patio and it was really nice. There were mountains all around where we were staying. Yes. Psalm 121 came to my mind. My eyes into the hills from that's gone with my help. And then I've never heard an audible voice of the Lord, but I had an impression that he said, I thought you were going to do whatever I needed to be done. Yeah. Yes, Lord, I did. But mm. you don't need a plan. I know you don't need a plan. I know it. Bottom line, I was a plan. And it wasn't just putting the clown hat on. We had to get all dressed up. We had to get face makeup. And then the worst part was they were practicing for a dance they had to do for the kids. I'm thinking, I can't do this, Lord. We need to be in the Yeah, well, unfortunately, I think the dance was going to be in some place. That's one thing I said to myself. All right, I'm in the Dominican Republic. No one is ever going to know what I did. But I think it was important. Um, but then you can get rid of that if you want to do this. So I was not my comfort zone, but because eventually I was the evil, I, I had a blessing um, that's in the story, but I'm not going to tell you tonight, but um, that I knew that was my aha moment from the trip. And I realized this is why I came. Mm -hmm. So I, I do write about that. Yeah. Any fishermen out there? I have two stories that relate to many life analogies. When I write or teach, I always like to use analogies, life analogies, and give a scripture. I do it. So uh, I talk about you know, successes in life. Drifting is a term in fishing. That can be good or not, and getting snagged in life or in fishing usually is not a good thing. Um, but before you think, you might you might be tempted to think, well, that's fishing. What, what's that have to do with the word? Uh, Jesus called us all to be fishers. Yeah, and yeah, that's we true. To be about, about this business in whatever capacity we can. In 2019, I was having a lot of headaches and back pain. And I just thought, well, I'm getting over. I was a painter. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm just stretching and everything is hurting. But it just it persisted. And finally, I relented after the urging of my wife and daughter. So I finally went to the doctor to see what's happening and scheduled a CAT scan. And maybe 10 days later, I was going to have a cast and all along. I was working every day, selling real estate, painting, having that is. I had a cast stand at 11 o'clock on a Friday morning. And when I came home to share to see Jerry, and we were going to go on a picnic lunch down to the board school. But when I got home, my doctor had already called my house and told me I had to get to the hospital immediately. And had an MRI again because the CAT scan showed a mass in the brain. Mm. 
and that was the boss of my, my headaches. And, mm -hmm. and I, so I talked about that story. There were things that were, in retrospect, I can see they were what he was planting in my life, the yeah. messages he was giving me, but I didn't realize why he was giving them to me in mind. So I found out about my tumor on Friday. They scheduled the surgery immediately. Um, I went to Jefferson Hospital and I was removed on Tuesday. On Thursday, I'm walking out of that hospital after having a brain surgery. And thankfully, I mean, there were conflicting reports whether it could be or would be cancerous, but it was not. Thank the Lord. And if you look real close, my scar is still here. They did a really good job putting up all my vocal person to crease. So, <laughs> and I haven't had to have any treatments or anything since. So that was a miracle. Thank you. Um, driving in two weeks, working in four weeks. So, wow. You know, I just I was, I'm thankful to the Lord for them. Um, Next up, everyone look at your palms on your hands. You got palms, you got it. What do you see? You see lines? They're called life lines. Some of them cross and some of them do not. In Isaiah 49, 16, it says, Behold, I have graven thee on the palms of my hands. He knows our lives. Yes. He knows who yes. and how our lives will cross and intersect with others. We should always be mindful of this because we never know when we might find out in life and our life path crossed with someone just by a word that we gave them or a deed we did. We can have a, a lifetime effect, even an eternal effect for right. people. Captain Willie, if you're still back there, um, I would ask you if you're here, do you remember our very first meeting? Uh, this is not on the so I'll have to tell you the story. He's gone. Is, can you talk, Captain? He, no, he can't. No, he can't talk. He did, but he, he I can. I can. He wants to finish. So I'm going to tell you stories since you're not here, Captain. But um, it's, it's just, I met. I to share the story. I first met Billy when I was 11 years old. And I had gone to Catholic school for wood school. And we were out playing on the playground. And we were, I don't know if we were playing tag or football or whatever, but a whole pile of kids. And he and I were like on the bottom of the pile. And that's how we met. And friends. Like they said with uh, Bill and Dan and I, we're friends over 52 years now. And what does this have to do with lifelines? Well, Billy's parents first introduced me to the assemblies. Um, and I wrote in the book, what that's an experience for a Catholic way to go to Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what's going on here, but they took me there. We went to Camp Kalawasa. Yeah, this was all before I was three. And as I said, Howard and Billy invited me to church here. But I could make a really good case and connect all the dots, which I, I won't do now. But that meeting of Billy when I was 11 years old led me to this church. Which led me to Beautiful. Near that. Beautiful. I could, I could make the case, very compelling case. So the point is, sometimes an insignificant encounter will have lasting effects. And Pastor said today, talking about the chocolates, your significant other, we're all significant. None of us are insignificant. Yes, <laughs> Okay. In closing, Sometimes when the speaker says in closing, everybody says, all right, keep all this time. Well, sometimes the speaker means that in closing. Sometimes he means I'm closing in on <laughs> or I'm thinking about closing in on closing. So you don't have to be the judge, but I'm down to two stories. So <clears throat> I'm not looking for a show of things, but 
Did you ever make a bad decision in your life that you knew that you had out of the will before you did? I did many times. So how many believe that the Lord can put us back on the right track? Yes. 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 That's right. Um, I have a story in my book called Recalculate. And Pastor, Pastor Moore gave a sermon and he called it Recalculate. Mm -hmm. And I talked a little bit about that in the story, but that has a lot of meaning for me. Um, after my first failed marriage, I write how I met Sherry, and the Lord put me back on the right path. That's good. Um, yes. I write in my book, and I have said this publicly too. That um, Jesus Christ saved my soul. There is someone who saved my life. Mm -hmm. And I write a very nice story how I met her. I was in the depths of despair way before I met her. Mm -hmm. And the Lord saw to it that my path, my life path, crossed the first. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned a couple of times today that this is a special day. And it's special for another reason. Okay. And that is because today is my wedding anniversary. Yeah. Uh, 38. 38. My wife, Sherry, the love of my life, that's not even going to be here today because she is celebrating in heaven. And she passed away unexpectedly on November the 7th. Yes. And the song was sung today in his presence. She really is in his presence. Yeah. Yes. And one of my favorite songs is I Can Only Imagine. Mm -hmm. And we can only imagine what she and other loved ones have gone on before us are experiencing. But I like to think, I like to think, I know she's whole and happy and, and safe. Yes. Sherry was a brilliant woman, and I don't say that lightly because she was. She could have been anything she wanted to be in life. She chose to be a teacher. Anyone who knew her would say she was a beautiful person. Yes. Yes, she was. She was a talented singer, an exceptional teacher. She impacted hundreds and hundreds of people. And she loved the Lord with her whole heart. She was a terrific wife, a terrific mother, a terrific grandmother. Beautiful. I loved her very much. And I miss her very much. Now, <clears throat> this is for you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. We sound corny, but we fell in love pretty much at the, on first sight. I write about that story. But really, it really was. Um, it was. It was wonderful. And I don't, I don't say this too, but it's in the book. But when our first, our first date was my best day. Now, aside from giving my heart to the Lord, think about your best day. It was my best day. Good. If I hadn't met her, I wouldn't have three daughters. And who knows where I would, where I'd be in life. But that was my best thing. Um, I mentioned rest earlier. <laughs> Sherry uh, was a year ahead of me in high school. And during her senior year in life, she was a year leader, preparing for my wrestling matches. And I had no clue who she was. <laughs> and I didn't. And yeah. one, of, one of the cheers the girls would, would say, when a wrestler was trying to get up off the mat, he was standing out and he'd say, get up, get up, Sam, get up. And if, if she can, and I, I don't know, I, and I don't know what, what is known between heaven and earth, I, I don't know, but if, if she could tell me, she would, she would now, she would say, get up, get up, get up. Yeah. So I like to think she's cheering for me now. Okay, final story. It's called Finish Well. Any football fans 
might know what this means if you see the coach doing this. And fourth quarter, guys, now or never, you got it. You got to put out. You got to do it. I know you might be tired, but you have, you have to do it. And one of my stories is finished well is about that. How that we don't know. None of us know how long we're going to live. But, but you know, being seniors, it's a really good chance we're in our fourth quarter right now. Um. So what are we doing? Are we busy for the Lord? Again, we have to be about our father's business in whatever whatever capacity we can be. I have a plaque on my wall that says the greatest use of life is spend it for something that will outlast it. The greatest use of life is spend it for something that will outlast it. That something is eternity for us. Yes. For those whose paths we cross, and we also, I believe, we have a responsibility to leave a legacy behind. Yeah, for the family, for the ministry, or just an example. Now, this past week was the Super Bowl, and the champion, Kansas City Chiefs, they have, they are. Things. They have a legacy for being the world champions. And even the Eagles that were there, that's no small task to get to the Super Bowl. So that's that's part of their legacy, but we don't have to be famous to have a legacy. You know, we're all special in God's city, and we're all here for a purpose, and we all have a special purpose. Yes. We can leave a legacy of kindness. Yes. Of a peacemaker, a lover of God, that should be part of our legacy that we were a lover of God. Yes. And so I hope this next part fits in the fourth quarter, but I've said this a couple of times when I talk to Sunday school parents for ministry. You know, you know, we've all been to funeral, you know, we, you know, funerals of just loved ones that are deceased. Sometimes we get a chance to get up and talk. And say something nice and wonderful. Sometimes that opportunity is not there. But part of our fourth quarter, I, I would I would make a suggestion to you. If there's a person that means a lot to you and me, that has done something special to maybe call you to come to the Lord, and there's something good that you want to sell them, yes. don't wait for the funeral to have that's right. Well, now, well, we have the opportunity. I can speak for myself too. Like there are times I've been funerals and think, wow, oh, they're wonderful to me. I wish I could say this and said that. That's a suggestion, not a commitment. Yes. And I'll offer another suggestion. All of us have a book in us. Okay, you could get it published. It's not an easy task, but we all have a story to tell. Yeah. And in and, and previous generations, stories of family would be passed down from one generation to the next. I'm pretty sure that's a lost art right now. That's right. Write your story down. Write your kids. And the grandkids know about it. Um, there's nothing wrong or vain about that. It's just, that's our history. That's our legacy. So it needs to be passed down. Yes. One, one of the difficult tasks um, for myself, I mean, my daughter's helped me um, since she passed, go, be going through her stuff and deciding what I'm going to do with everything. Um, so, I was cleaning out her desk on top of her desk, was piled full of stuff and taking things off. I came across this book. It's like a little book that you, the shutterfly would make. Um, and it said, My Grandma and Me. And it was a brand new book. I'm going to wonder why she had this, what she's going to do with it. And while I was thinking about it, the thought came to me you know what? I'm going to make a book on my way. And we're going to call it Mama's book because she was always Mama. And we are going to have 
a page of her, I have pictures of her teaching, I have pictures of her praising the Lord, mm -hmm. I have videos of her singing, and she loved to fish, I have a vision picture, just look, the things that she loved to do, I will accumulate these pictures and put them in the book. And I will talk to, to my grand my grandchildren were age range in age of 10 to not quite one yet. And the younger ones still. But the older ones I'm going to talk to, what did you like about mama? What stories do you remember? What are the things she said that, that stuck in your mind? So I'm going to interview all these kids. I'm a writer, so I will write these things down in the book, and I'll put the pictures in the book, and we'll make a book on the kids, all my grandkids, and they will have that for the, for the rest of their life. So that's her <coughs> legacy. Sherry's legacy lives in students. I can't tell you how many how many of her former students have reached out to me and said, I'm a teacher of Sherry, or I've seen ministry. <coughs> I got come across people who said, oh, Sherry wrote me these notes. She was so helpful to me at a certain time of my life. And some of those students were from Milba High School where she taught for nine years, for eight years. And she taught for Como, at Como Christian for 22. But the Milba High School kids, I've been able to track down because I have the letters and pictures she had with Sherry. And I was able to send them back and be in conversation with them and either over email or phone. And, and one girl that I spoke with, she, when I talked to her, she just wept because she was so close, so close to my wife. So I'm, I'm getting blessed by doing these things too. Yes. Her legacy lives on, it's gonna live on in these books too. Okay, so in closing, real quick this time, um, I'm gonna like to leave you with a quote because I like quotes. It's not what you gather, but what you scatter. It tells you what kind of life you have lived. It's not what you gather, but what you scatter. It tells what kind of life you have lived. Yeah. Amen. And finally, this, this is a special day. This, this is the day that the Lord has made. Yes. Man. Yeah. Uh, you have some books with you? I do. And uh, what are the books cost? They're $15.